Welcome to our evening book talk by John Roy Price. The last liberal Republican, an insider's perspective on Nixon's surprising social policy. One might well ask, what does Richard Nixon have to do with Herbert Hoover? The obvious connection is that they are the only presidents of the Quaker faith, although Nixon may have been more visible in expressing his Quaker views. Hoover, as the grand old man of the Republican Party, is frequently consulted by younger members of the party, and Nixon was no exception. Hoover's interest in providing Americans access with a better quality of life through his efforts at providing better childhood health care, more efficient delivery of services at lower costs through standardization, and efforts at providing a social safety net through company and private insurers anticipates much of what John Roy Price describes in his years working with Daniel Patrick Moynihan and President Nixon. John Roy Price was born in Manhasset, New York, and is a graduate of Grinnell College. He earned a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford University, where he studied politics and development economics. From there, he attended Harvard Law School, and was one of the founders of the Ripon Society, a group of young Republicans serving as pol a policy bridge between academics and elected officials. He served on a community development group in Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, creating a $100 million mortgage pool for homeowners, home ownership, and debt consolidation for overwhelmingly black and Hispanic residents. Using uh, or under President Nixon, he became a special assistant and later assumed the chair as executive secretary of the Council for Urban Affairs upon the departure of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Here he crafted Nixon's social policy that included proposals for guaranteed income for families with children, the Family Assistance Plan, expansion of food stamps and nutrition programs, and a call for a universal health care or health insurance. Upon leaving his White House service, he began a 40-year career in financing. Following Mr. Price's talk, there will be time for brief questions. Copies of his book are available for sale in the museum store, and I'm sure John would be more than happy to sign your purchase. All of our programs are made possible from support from uh, the Hoover Presidential Foundation. If you're not a member, I hope you will consider joining our, our membership brochures at the sales desk. So join me now in welcoming our speaker, John Roy Price. Um, thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be back in Iowa. I have a connection with the Hoover Library here in that my senior paper at Grinnell resides here, right here. It was a paper about Herbert Hoover's 1928 presidential campaign in the state of Iowa when he ran against Al Smith in 1928. So I'm in your archives somewhere. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm just delighted to be here. I, I'm in the sense of trying to see Hoover's role and the movement of the party away from Hoover's role in the 20th century, it's very important to recall that Hoover was a figure uh, with wide respect because of his extraordinary efforts in, in bringing food to starving millions after the war. But beyond that, he was uh, regarded as a great humanitarian and uh, was really, in a way, the continuation of a Theodore Roosevelt after Roosevelt had left and the more conservative elements of the party had become dominant. So when Hoover was beginning to get back into public life in the 1920s, he was paired in the cabinet in the first Republican administration in 1921 with a man named Andrew Mellon. Andrew Mellon is very representative of my now hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and was a formidable figure because of his wealth and his influence in the Republican Party, not just in Pennsylvania, but in the nation. 
when I first moved to Pittsburgh to take up my job uh, heading a bank there a few years ago, I read a biography of Andrew Mellon by a man named Carl Canadine, and he told about how Mellon uh, was, was critical of Hoover and would constantly write in his diaries about Herbert Hoover uh, as though it was a terrible thing. He said, he's an activist. You know, and uh, as though this was a pejorative. Well, what happened was Hoover had attracted a huge amount of very uh, interesting, ambitious, and capable young people into the Republican Party in that image. And then, after the defeat in 32, Hoover began to become more and more critical of the New Deal, became more, more negative in the view of many. <clears throat> and a lot of these young people that he had drawn into the Republican Party <clears throat> began to turn elsewhere because they saw a tendency within the party to return to what they thought was a, a much more uh, ossified or, or backward-looking group. Anyway, uh, my main point to start is that there was, in the middle 20th century, two real pieces of the Republican Party. There was the, the leftover of the Hoover regulars, which dominated lots of uh, Midwestern and all through the country, lots of local organizations. But you had what I call the mid-20th century presidential wing of the Republican Party. And this was to be seen in someone as early as Alf Landon of Kansas when he ran in 1936. Quite unsuccessfully, it was like a kamikaze mission uh, against Franklin Roosevelt. But Landon was a progressive governor of Kansas who had won an election uh, when no other Republican was reelected. And then you had Wendell Welke in 1940. And then you had Thomas Dewey, who was the Republican governor of New York twice. He ran against Franklin Roosevelt in 44 and was blown away. And then he ran against Harry Truman in 48, and he was unsuccessful. Wasn't quite blown away because everybody expected uh, Dewey to win. And then at the last minute, you remember the iconic photograph, Harry Truman's holding up the Chicago Tribune's front page saying, Dewey wins! And Truman is beaming. <laughs> anyway, uh, Nixon was part of that mid-century presidential wing of the Republican Party. He was a moderate in many ways. And also, a key figure was Eisenhower. And Eisenhower had just finished winning in Europe the war in Europe, the World War II, and he and those coming back, for the most part, did not want to fight a war against the New Deal. In other words, they might be what you call rhinos today, but they believed in the social safety net. And in fact, Eisenhower, in his presidency, expanded social security dramatically, and he also, through the tax code, Eisenhower created the whole employer-sponsored health insurance program, which the labor unions loved, large employers loved, but it was a, a program and an initiative which dramatically expanded the coverage of health insurance for families, of working people. And Nixon was part of that tradition. And Nixon got a leap into the political stratosphere in May of 1952, when he gave a speech in New York, and I was just there yesterday, day before yesterday, at the National Women's Republican Club, in West 51st Street, and Dewey sat on the dais and he listened to Richard Nixon speak. And this was nearly the time of the convention, 52 convention, and uh, so Dewey heard Nixon, was deeply impressed with him, called him aside afterwards and said, I want you to be thinking about the vice presidency. And he became deeply involved as a backer of Nixon. Well, fast forward through the Eisenhower years and then Nixon's defeat in 1960. And he then had what Pat Buchanan calls the greatest comeback. It was extraordinary how he came back in those eight years to win the presidency in 68. Well, what, what did he bring with him uh, at that point? What had happened under Eisenhower was that the conservative movement was sort of suppressed because Eisenhower was vastly popular. He was productive in, in policy. Uh, 
and he was someone that people felt comfortable with, that they felt they could entrust the, the safety, the security of the country in his hands, in his capable, proven hands. And Nixon was a willing vice president, a willing student of Eisenhower's, a student of Eisenhower's sense of orderliness, of a staff system, things like that, not a student of what he thought was the occasional too much delay or lack of decisiveness. But Nixon watched it all, observed it all. Having been beaten, he then came back for more, as we know. And I want to uh, show you how he did really stay in that mainstream presidential wing of the party. One reason Eisenhower ran in 1952 was Bob Taft. Bob Taft represented the congressional wing, unlike Tom Dewey, the presidential wing, Senator Robert Taft of Ohio was the key Republican in the Congress. And he was an isolationist before the war, which of course grated against Dwight Eisenhower. And Dewey, the week of Dunkirk, the week of the evacuation of almost half a million French and British and Belgian troops from, from France in the face of the Nazi invasion, uh, the week of Dunkirk, Bob Taft had given a speech in Kansas City saying, on balance, it probably would be more beneficial for the United States if Germany won the war. Mm. And Eisenhower never forgot that. And when he, Eisenhower, was thinking about running, he sat down privately, confidentially, with Bob Taft. And he said, how do you feel about NATO? They just had created North Atlantic Treaty Organization. How do you feel about the Marshall Plan? about the Soviet Union. And Taft said, I can't support NATO. I'm, I don't believe in Americans getting out there. That did it for us now. All right, but now let's think of Nixon and domestic policy. I'm sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> but uh, let's segue into, into what was going on when Nixon came in. Uh, the country was a mess. 1968 saw urban riots, race riots, everywhere throughout America. I think there were 130 cities which had serious race riots. Detroit, Omaha, you name them, on they went. So there was a, a serious issue of urban resistance and racial animosity and tensions. You had something called the Vietnam War going on, which was dividing families and communities. And you also had a resurgent conservative movement. As I say, they'd been sort of tamped down or kept down under Eisenhower. But they had revived, and they had formed mass membership organizations, great new publications like the National Review and such. And so the Eisenhower old-timers were sort of losing their energy, and losing their, their effort. But uh, I will get now to the main part of the story. <laughs> but first, I want, if I can, you, it was mentioned that I was born in New York, actually in... Uh, New York City in Manhattan, and then I was, the next few years I lived in Queens County in New York City, then raised on suburban Long Island. But, that being said, I want to establish my bona fides as an <laughs> Iowa farm boy, okay? Uh, my granddad ran a dairy farm in Sheraton, down in Lucas County, just uh, southwest of here. And this would have been sometime around 1944-45, this is me on our Morgan Cowpony babe. And I was, this, this is almost a, an emotional thing with me, because I, as a young boy, as a New York kid, I was a witness to thrashing parties. This is the real thing. This is my granddad's neighbors helping to bring in the oats. And my grandmother would lay a table for 10 workers on her pine dining room table and feed them. They would briefly nap, and then they'd go back out for more. So uh, I, I have always had an interest in rural America, rural development. Anyway, um, this is a pair of people very important for that sort of establishment, presidential wing of the Republican Party. This man on the left is Walter Thayer, who was the head of the Herald Tribune newspaper in New York City. It was sort of like the voice of the Eastern Republican establishment. On the right, his left, was John Hay Whitney, called Jock Whitney. And Jock was a tremendously important figure in, in the sort of Eastern Republican crowd. Uh, he had been Eisenhower's campaign finance chairman in 52 and 56. And these folks were still in the business of trying to 
generate interest on the more moderate, progressive side of the Republican Party. Walter's papers also are here at, at this archive, here in the Hoover Library. Um, and then what they did was they helped support a group of young guys of whom this one in front here is a very much younger version of me. And that was the group called the Ripon Society, which grew up in the mid-1960s, as was said, uh, by, uh, to be a sort of a bridge between academia or policy people and guys who were trying to run for office or women and or, or actual office holders. And we became a sort of policy organization trying to prepare position papers on different subjects. And then the reality of elective politics was that the man who, more than any other, seemed to be the candidate of the more centrist, progressive wing of the party was Nelson Rockefeller, who was governor of New York, elected three times. And that's a young me. I wound up running his delegate intelligence operation for the 68 presidential campaign against Richard Nixon. And then uh, Nixon, when he finally won, um, he was a man of a, a very broad church. And he asked me to join the general election campaign, even though I worked against it. And then this is a man, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who has this sort of impish or puckish look on his face. And you can see Nixon almost tilting his head back laughing. They had a wonderful personal relationship. And Nixon brought Moynihan in. Moynihan was an active partisan Democrat who had first supported Robert Kennedy and then Hubert Humphrey against Nixon. Just like the picture before John Price had supported Nelson Rockefeller against Nixon. But as they say, he was a broad church. He was ecumenical. As Pat Buchanan, grinding his teeth, Pat and I were rivals and, and friends, and he, he says, it, it bothers Pat Buchanan, but he said Nixon wanted to hear all points of view. So anyway, here's Pat Moynihan, who became uh, someone that Nixon enjoyed immensely uh, as, as a conversationalist and as an idea provoker. And Pat was an active Democrat, never gave that up, and went on to be 24 years in the United States Senate as a Democratic senator from New York. This is another side of Richard Nixon, right here in West Branch. He was driving home in 1937 from Duke Law School. And his mom is here, and his grandmother, his Quaker grandmother here, and one brother up there, and the last to go, little Ed, he died a couple years ago there. Uh, so as, as Tom said, uh, Nixon didn't wear it on his sleeve, but he was a more uh, involved Quaker, I think you would say, than, than was Herbert Hoover. So that, that's an important strand in my story, is the, the Quaker impact on Nixon and his policies. Now, Nixon was interested in process and not just in policy. Part of this he picked up from Eisenhower, as I mentioned earlier, the orderliness, the moving of paper and ideas. But he also just, he, it gave him comfort. And so what he did was, because of the inflamed situation in the domestic sphere here, as well as the war in Vietnam, he said, I want to create something like the National Security Council, which is used for foreign policy, and I'd like to do that for domestic policy. And so we brought in Pat Moynihan, whose picture was just a moment ago, and uh, he formed by executive order this Council for Urban Affairs. And these are basically the whole domestic cabinet. And you may recognize one or two. This was George Romney. I'm sorry, let's go back. And George Romney, who is the father of Mitt, whom you well know now. Uh, John Mitchell, who was the Attorney General. George Schultz, who went on to be Secretary of Treasury and Secretary of State under Reagan. Arthur Burns, who went on to become the head of the Federal Reserve. Uh, Secretary of Agriculture, who used to be Chancellor of the University of Nebraska, uh, my friend Pat Moynihan, Maurice Stans, others. And this was the very first piece of paper Dixon signed in his presidency, the official act creating the Urban Affairs Council. <clears throat> this was the Moynihan staff, and this is a posed photo. We're all trying to look like we're crazy. And uh, Pat is here in the, the tallest one. He towered over everybody. 
Uh, this is the famous political cartoonist Thomas Nast, who wrote the Boss Tweed cartoons. If you remember these, these blippy cartoons of Boss Tweed, well, Nast made a fortune out of his cartoons. And in this portrait, he was painted after he'd lost his fortune through a swindler. <laughs> so he's looking displeased. And this Moynihan staff was, was young, few, and worked hard. Let me shift away from policy making for a moment and tell you about one of the most emotional and wonderful moments of my entire life, which happened uh, in the White House. This is the night of July 20th, I think it was, 1969, when the astronauts alit on the moon. And you can see over here in the background, this is in the cabinet room, and there's a TV set right here. We had just been watching them get out and do their first walk on the moon. And this is Dwight Chapin, who's the President's Appointment Secretary. This is myself. This is the Oval Office back behind me. This is Ollie Atkins, who's the President's official photographer, taking a, a break and being photographed instead of doing the photography. And uh, after this, uh, some time went by, and then Dwight and I went back to the Oval Office, and we actually were with Nixon and Bob Alderman when he talked to the astronauts on the moon. And it was just one of these moments of an American apogee in our history. You know, one of the climactic moments of, of America's sense of itself and role in the world. And, so, and I was blessed to, to be there and to have that moment uh, put aside inside me. So that was remarkable. And then uh, Nixon worked on two related projects which had to do with income and he after a lot of iterations and a lot of to and fro and a lot of arguing from history historical example Nixon embraced the idea of a guaranteed income for families with children and uh, it was called the family assistance plan or FAP for short FAP and it was something called a negative income tax and the first time I ever met Richard Nixon was two nights before he went up and filed in the New Hampshire primary to run for president in 68. And I was at a dinner for 10 of us in Manhattan with him. And I said, you know, think about the remarkable confluence of thought on a negative income tax between Milton Friedman, who had been Barry Goldwater's economics advisor in 64, and a lot of uh, liberal economists. I said they want to find a way to attack poverty through income shortage. And he said, we've got to do something about welfare. It was, it was an issue a lot like immigration is today. It was a hot button issue. And it was on the lips of every politician and everybody had an idea about it. But Nixon really got into it and into the trenches on it. And then he had a related thing moving along, which was the food stamp issue. And food stamps we now know as SNAP, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. Forty million Americans, in however many millions of families, now receive income help, the purchasing power of food through SNAP. Nixon took a program which was checkered. It was really heavily emphasizing commodity food distribution, surplus food, which was more the farm lobby that was interested in it. Uh, and there was from one place or another, there might have been a food stamp program, which was like a cash assistance for buying food, but it was not universal and it was all over the lot in terms of eligibility or what you would get. So what Nixon did, thanks in no small part to this guy, was to radically transform the American income landscape with the food stamp program. This is an interesting man on the left. He was a Frenchman. His name was Jean Mayer. And he had been in World War II, he'd been captured by the SS and the Gestapo, killed one of his captors, escaped, was captured again, managed to escape again, broke a leg, always walked with a limp, but he had a little bit of grit, as you might imagine, <laughs> after that experience. And so he was forceful, and you know, he stuck by his guns. And this is the report of a, a White House conference he ran on food, nutrition, and health. And he's giving the report books over to Nixon, then the three of us sat down at, at the Oval Office table, and Nixon pushes the books over to me and says, 
you make it happen, you implement it. But that began the food stamp effort. And the food stamps were passed and did become the first negative income tax. What, is, what does negative income tax mean? You know what an income tax is, and you know that you pay a higher amount of tax, the higher your income is. Well, the concept of a negative income was that if you have an income that is at or below the poverty standard, the poverty line, that this payment will supplement your income. It's like an income supplement. And they called it a negative income tax because it was the opposite of an income tax on positive income. And so the principle was actually passed in the food stamp program. And it's in existence today. Nixon fought, as we will see, for two years to pass it. Didn't manage. This is also food related. This is me on the right. Nixon is signing a bill on the school lunch. And he was uh, fanatical about child nutrition. School lunch and breakfast programs and is here signing that bill. Now, what happened to family assistance and what happened to the Republican Party? Um, this is a meeting in August of 1969 at President Nixon's place out in San Clemente, California. And Nixon had invited governor, then governor of California, Ronald Reagan, to come and Nixon was going to try to persuade him to come on board in support of Nixon's welfare reform negative income tax idea. And Nixon asked me to do the briefing papers for Nixon before he met with him. And so I pulled a bunch of statistics together. And then he, he said, I want you there at the meeting. So I was there. And Nixon tried manfully to get Reagan to come around and failed. And as I wrote in the book, I said, it was fascinating, because there we were at San Clemente, right on the ocean, right at the shore, and said, what's some of the best surfing coastline anywhere in North America? And so outside I could see the Pacific, you know, pounding on the shore, just, just a few feet away. But there we were at sea level, but I felt at this moment as though I were atop a continental divide <laughs> because Nixon had this one view which was consistent and, and in him viscerally, which was the federal government needed to address people's problems and their needs, and particularly in the, so, in the safety net area. He was not a kid in abject poverty, but they were always living on the margin. And so he was well aware of many members of his family, as in my own, uh, uh, of, all of an extended family, of the impact of near poverty. And so he was, he was always of a mindset that was, look, let's, let's do something about this. Let's not say government is the enemy and go away. He said, let's, let's do something about it. And Reagan, on the other hand, atop this continental divide, was going down that path which he pursued rhetorically and policy-wise, which was, no, no, we want to get the government out of our lives, and it is the enemy, and, you know, all kinds of cute vignettes about, we're the government, we're here to help you, and making that a joke. So, it didn't work. Yes. And Reagan then actively worked against Nixon's welfare reform. Mm -hmm. And, but Nixon fought for it for two years. And thanks to my, my friend Pat Buchanan, um, as I say, with whom I had constant differences, he introduced me to a lot of his right-wing friends, and we looked back together at our efforts on the real welfare reform. And I met one or two who'd been absolutely, you know, just inflamed uh, opponents of the proposal. But we, we found common cause in understanding how it all played out. And as I say, Reagan really was a central figure in its death. Then uh, I mentioned that Daniel Patrick Moynihan had been made by Nixon the staff director of the Urban Affairs Council. And this is, the, this is me, and here's Pat Moynihan, John Ehrlichman, the president. This was December 5th of 69 when Nixon appointed me Pat's successor as the staff director of this cabinet level body with a few hangers on around the edge of the room. Um, but I, I loved it and worked on the the issues that I mentioned, plus I also got very deeply involved in 
the health insurance effort by Nixon. One, and then two of his brothers died of tuberculosis. They had no health insurance. His mother, whom he adored, Hannah, and called her a saint, with absolute conviction, uh, had to go and attend, in turn, each of her two sons at a sanitarium in Arizona, where they went in hopes, vain hopes, of their surviving. So she would help other patients to help pay for her son. So he lost two brothers, and he always carried with him this impulse about, um, you know, trying to do something for those at the margins or who can't, just quite can't make it. Like the, the income program for welfare. It wasn't welfare, it was an income supplement. And he was driven to that because he watched working families. You know, you'd have a working father, but he may have had three kids and a really low paying job, or maybe four or five kids, and he couldn't make it. So that's why. Nixon was sensitive to those issues. This was, um, I'm over here on the, on the left, and then this is Elliot Richardson, who was the head of health education and welfare at the time. This is Jerry Ford, later, my later president, and the president, and this is in the, in the Oval Office. And Nixon came out with a proposal for sweeping coverage of health insurance for the American family. And uh, it was called FIP. You remember FAP was the Family <laughs> Assistance Plan? We made it easy. So FIP was the Family Health Insurance Plan. So you can remember the twins. And um, so he fought again for this. And it included all kinds of things, all kinds of inpatient, outpatient care, um, glasses, hearing, dental, um, mental health. And guess what? 40 years, I mean 4-0 years, before Obamacare, Richard Nixon proposed covering pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. You know, just dramatic, extensive, uh, ambitious, courageous, and maybe for all those reasons <laughs> it failed the passage, he didn't get it. But he fought for it hard. And so that is the last liberal Republican. Mm -hmm. you know, he, and I... I can't go into things like school desegregation, where he has an interesting sort of counterintuitive record. <clears throat> but uh, from where I sat for the first three years of his administration there in the White House, uh, he was he was fascinating, always tactical. I mean, he was always a brilliant tactician as a politician. But beyond the tactics, he had a sense of process and uh, formal consideration of things. He had a sense of strategy. As with Henry Kissinger, looking at political matters on an international framework, where they tried to impose a strategic framework on it, so too, particularly with Daniel Patrick Moynihan, did Nixon and Moynihan try to look at domestic affairs with the same sort of shaping analysis of a strategy. So I, uh, I was thrilled with my opportunities there. Um, I can't imagine having not enjoyed that as a young man. Unbelievable blessing. And uh, I would be happy to open to questions, either from Tom or anybody else. So, thank you. <laughs> Sir. So, <clears throat> where is the Ripon Society today in terms of it's, um, does it represent kind of the idealistic, liberal, youthful? I, I am completely out of touch with it. So are the other founders. In that group I showed you earlier, you had one fellow who was a congressman from Wisconsin for years. Another was the uh, publisher and chief executive of the International Herald Tribune for 14 years in Paris. Um, others went off to scientific careers, but it really became Washingtonized. And so we, really, I mean, they, they become more, you know, accommodating to, to lobbyist interests and so on. There's not, there's not that sense, and, and the big issue for our generation was civil rights, was the, don't forget, in 64, the public accommodation civil rights bill passed in 65, the voting rights bill passed, those were huge. Uh, efforts 
Um, and so the, the Ripon generation was, was focused on civil rights, on things like making government work better with revenue sharing. The thought, the federal government raises money well, may not spend it always too well. Let's run some through the states and let them at a level closer to the people make discretionary decisions about how to spend that money. Well, that came into a Donnybrook with the, the kings of the hill, of Capitol Hill, because they liked to be there for the ribbon cutting, because they got a bill passed that specifically repaired the western half of the bridge over the what river, you know. And they did like the idea of the governors getting free money and, and them getting the credit. Uh, but so Ripon was involved in a lot of issues of substance like what, like the negative income tax, like revenue sharing, like the Vietnam War, uh, like things that sound a lot more arcane today, like a Biafra controversy in Nigeria. But it, it evolved into much more of a sort of, if I can be honest, you know, with a careerist, um, it's my job. Whereas we were all young, idealistic, moving on. And I suppose it's the attitude of any elder toward the next two generations down. So, oh, there we go. So to follow up, yes. um, Abraham Lincoln said... Of whom he is a scholar. Said, said that uh, a person of no party is of no consequence, pointing out the fact that political parties were the major mechanism of change and also parties had platforms which meant something right. that, that that was kind of right. what they stood for it seems that parties have moved away from that you you never hear about the platform Include, and, including the fact there wasn't even one written for the republican party in the last presidential year Right. And and so, is it, I mean, where are political parties now as agents of change? It seems that people don't want to identify with them. Right. And that the people who run under a party uh, banner are really more the running as personalities rather than representing a set of ideals. I, I wish you could have all heard uh, Dr. Schwartz's comments, and they were using a quote from Abraham Lincoln about parties, that if you don't belong to a party, you, you, you have no impact, basically, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, and then going on asking about uh, what, what, where are we today? What's the future? Because the parties appear to have become only that of personalities, not of program or platform around which people can orient themselves. And I, you know, I'm currently and I'm currently registered as a nonpartisan registration in Pennsylvania, so I'm no longer a registered Republican. And I understand what you're saying. I watch primary campaigns in both parties, and I say, well, maybe I should register, but I don't. Uh, and your point is key that we have moved away from the time and the place where ideas help to draw adherence, and that they got more concrete and more programized or policyized, if I can call it that, as opposed to just rhetoric. And so I don't know, I don't know where we're going. I've, I've, because I've been around a long time doing this and thinking about these things, I am aware of occasional impulses toward a third party. You know, when I watched John Anderson in 1980, I think it was, and we all watched Ross Perot, and we watched Pat Buchanan, uh, you know, run against George uh, Bush 41. And I always thought for a long time that these were fruitless. They were, they were not going to come to anything because <clears throat> there was not enough galvanizing force to... And I think it comes to a combination of a person, an idea, at a time of dissolution of the other, of the main parties. And I think we've, I'm not sure that we've got the person or the idea, but I, I feel more than I've ever felt in my life that we are at a dissolving point. That we're like 1854, 56, and into 1860, when you had the so-called know-nothings, when you had the Whigs, you had the regional Democrats, and you had the new Republican Party, 
which was more of an urban, more reforming, kind of a, 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 an emerging baby party. And I, I, I just instinctively think that, as you look at the results from the other day, from this week, uh, people are groping to find some way that is not, you know, either the the crowd or whatever they call it in the you know the left or the hard right. They they want people who talk to them, talk to each other, <laughs> and who can begin to prioritize and do something about the problems of the country. And more importantly, not let slip from our grasp the role of leadership this country's played since the end of that, that war in 1945. Because we're running the risk of doing that in our chaos, confusion, anger, lack of direction. So, thank, you. thank you. That's an Iowa crowd. <laughs> Absolutely. How about other questions? Yes, yes. Um, I was going to ask, maybe, maybe it's a, to, to dig a little deeper into, into that response. And, and since you've got the younger you on the screen right behind you. <laughs> yes, you, once I was. And, and you made the reference to, in those times, looking at elder statesmen and elder policymakers compared to you youngsters sitting in the room. I was wondering, with the benefit of hindsight, if you were that younger policy person today, yes. with the benefit of hindsight, and, and, and information, and now being one of the elders in the room, what would you do in today's world to conquer some of these same problems that are still big problems or have resurfaced as big problems uh, in today's society? Well, you're, 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 uh, it's not quite Demosthenes yelling against the waves, but you're, you're fighting a lot of other forces uh, of a vastly more diffuse information array uh, than we had then. I mean, I, I showed you Walter Thayer at the, at the beginning, the New York Herald Tribune. It was it was a, a, a focal point for a point of view of a very large number of voters, and then you had the, you had the television world, and within a block and a half or two blocks, you had the three major networks, which really were dominant in shaping and certainly in conveying news and framing it a little bit, but also helping to shape public opinion. And, and uh, so you had things which were more helping, uh, helping people and policies cohere and not have you know, nuclear fission, where they're just exploding and going outwards. So you're up against a lot. Well, okay, how would, you, how would you combat it? What would you do? As Abraham Lincoln said, find and gather up a lot of the wild young men around town and start, you know, find people that you can relate to, that have purpose, have energy, have passion, and hopefully don't have hard right or hard left views, but can read the, what I was trying to say, I think was being shown again this week, which is, you know, in a lot of states you wouldn't expect, the voters seem to want things to cool down, and they want people to talk to each other, and they want to see problems addressed, and I really, think what I said at, at the last that got a lovely emotional response from you. I also think they don't want to see America cause itself to decline rapidly in the eyes of the world. I don't know if that even starts you on an answer, but... Certainly. Thanks. Anybody else? Well, thank you for showing up tonight. This, oh, yeah. we have here a California <laughs> visitor actually from, from the Hoover Institution in California. We're going to ask the California. Yeah, Jean no, I was just wondering, John, you know, I, meant, I, I can't help but notice, of course, in most of the, you know, the photographs that you've shown us, there are very few women. So, oh, and, were there not? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, Isn't that the truth? And, you know, there weren't, wasn't a policy that specifically... Um, that you mentioned that spoke to you know women's rights of the time period. So I'm just wondering if you could discuss Nixon's um, attitude about women's rights and how he dealt with the major feminists of the time he, period. Well, he was uh, Richard Nixon was quite responsive to his wife Patricia, <laughs> <laughs> and she was she was a believer in the Equal Rights Amendment, for example. Mm -hmm. Also, also Richard Nixon was the guy who passed Title IX. And so people aren't aware of that, and that, that has a lot to do with academia and, and women's place and so on. And, um, 
And he was surrounded by uh, some people who uh, themselves had not a single woman on their staff. Bob Haldeman, you and I have talked about it. Mm -hmm. Richard Nixon's chief of staff, I don't think, you know, would recognize a woman if he saw one. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were others in the, in the uh, administration. Barbara Franklin, who became the, the Secretary of Commerce, of all things, mm -hmm. speaking of Herbert Hoover. Um, she worked in the White House and then took on a cabinet role. Uh, but it was a different time, and it was, uh, but, but he was, you know, if, if goaded or not goaded by his wife, he had some good impulses there. And he was very strong on Native American help. Uh, he, was, he was a real leader on, on recognition of the rights of and, and help for Native Americans. But I, I can't, uh, I mean, the Ripon Society, we were all guys too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you, how do you think the Republican Party has changed? Yes. In that well, way? the whole America has changed. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Well, thank you for showing up. I'm, I'm so grateful and I appreciate your appreciation. So I'll be happy to sign a book. Before you